So I'm Jeff Navala, and my group uh, develops new technologies uh, primarily for the reading and writing of molecular information. As far as motivations from a biological or understanding biology perspective, why do we care about proteins? So when you go from a genotype to phenotype, proteins are two steps closer along this path of the central dogma. Now, from an analytical perspective, the proteome represents a much larger challenge compared to uh, the transcriptome or the genome because there's orders of magnitude more complex at the proteome level compared to levels further upstream. A big challenge with proteins is that they cannot be amplified like DNA and RNA can, and the methods that we have currently available to sequence them are very immature compared to DNA and RNA analysis. When you're looking at protein analysis, what motivates the need for new single molecule proteomics tools? And it's really because all of this protein variation is encoded post-genomic levels. Take, for example, a single protein substrate. It can be modified modified by different enzymes by introducing post-translational modifications to different residues on that protein. And each of these different modifications can completely change essentially the, the activity of that protein and its downstream effects within the cell. And essentially, each protein then has its own post-translational modification code that depends on these uh, combinatorics of these modifications. And again, the important thing here is that each of these different proteoforms can have a completely different function. What that means then is that each of them represent a potentially novel biomarker or drug target. If we look at the grand challenges then for proteomics tools is we really want high resolution combined with sensitivity. We want it to be high throughput such that it can handle high dynamic range. And we also want it to be quantitative such that we can quantify how much of each of these proteoforms we have within the cell. So if we look at the existing proteomics technologies, none of them can really check all of these boxes at once, which motivates us to develop our nanopore single molecule protein sequencing approach because it could potentially solve many of these challenges. So if we look at nanopore sensors and how they work at a very basic level, essentially you can have a tiny a nanometer sized hole within a insulating membrane and the way that they act as a sensor is you apply a constant voltage across that pore and it drives ionic current flow through that pore's aperture. And, and you measure this ionic current flow over time and that's what essentially generates your, your nanopore signal. When you have a molecule that flows or is translocated through that pore, it's gonna block the amount of ions that are able to flow through that pore and that generates your potentially unique signal for that analyte molecule. With the combination of a molecular motor that they can ratchet that DNA strand reproducibly through protein pore the right structural dimension such that you could uh, achieve single nucleotide resolution as that strand is ratcheted through the pore. The fundamentals of this technology has been commercialized for both DNA and direct RNA sequencing, first by Oxford Nanopore Technologies, and there's a number of other nanopore-based companies that are coming to market as well. The natural question is, is how can we extend this technology to sequence proteins? So threading proteins through nanopores is much more difficult than threading RNA and DNA. Proteins have a, a non-uniform charge along the backbone, and so you cannot rely consistently on electrophoretic forces to guide the movement of your protein through the pore. And you also have complex and stable tertiary structures that if you're trying to look at full-length proteins, you need some way to unfold those such that you can linearly thread your protein through the pore for sequence analysis. So to really get to full-length proteins, borrowing from the lessons of DNA sequencing, what we'd want is a protein processive motor. So one of these machines is called Clipex, and what this does is it's able to grab onto tagged proteins at their C-terminal and then mechanically destabilize them essentially just by pulling on their strand until it destabilizes that tertiary structure, and then it continues in translocation of that protein substrate through the, the central constriction of Clipex. And inside the cell, this typically goes into a Clip-P, which is a, a protease. We're taking this motor control using this enfoldase, and what we've done here is combined it with the protein pores on a commercially available minion nanopore array, which is a CSGG variant. Combining these approaches, we've developed what we're calling an Audi unfoldase mediated protein translocation approach using the minion. In this study, we um, used a motor called ClipX that allows protein translocated through the nanopore. As shown here, we uh, made a engineered protein that has uh, an analyte domain. And also this protein has blocking domain that blocks complete translocation of the protein to go through the nanopore. 
And then this protein also has the SSR domain that Clip X motor can bind. So firstly, we added the protein to the nanopore flow cell. And then this protein has negative charges on the N-terminal side. So this protein is going to be thread through the nanopore by electrophoresis. After this protein is captured within the nanopore, the blocking domain called in green here blocks the protein transplugate through the nanopore. While this protein stores within the nanopore, we load ClipX motor. And then this ClipX motor binds to the SSR tag that is attached to the C-terminal side of the protein. The ClipX motor start to translocate the protein and then the ClipX motor also can unfold the blocking domain so that eventually the protein is going to be pulled up from the nanopore. In these events, we see the ionic current traces that correspond to each state. So firstly, the open post state because there's nothing within the nanopore. And then once the protein is captured by the pore, it shows the current drop as shown here. Then we load the ClipX motor. Then after like uh, one or two minutes, the ClipX motor binds to the protein and it's going to start unfold the protein. You can see the unfolding signal in the beginning. And after that, you can see the ClipX mediated protein translocation traces. Then it's eventually going to go back to open pore state. We analyzed several protein variants to see if we can see the difference between the four protein variants. For example, the blue line corresponding to the protein sequence as shown here. So this protein has a glycine. When we mutated some of the glycine residues into tyrosine residues, it caused current drop. So this results clearly shows that we can get sequence dependent ionic current traces. We then designed these specific synthetic proteins in order to study the effect that each amino acid has without having to worry about the um, reading window context that you could kind of see in those proteins that KSK just showed. And we call these proteins pastors, proteins for amino acid sequencing through optimized regions. So these pastors have the same C terminal tags as before, but the analyte region changes. And these analyte regions have strategically placed repeating blocks. And these blocks have a single amino acid change in each one of them. And then on either side of the single amino acid change, there's a linker, which was designed to prevent overlapping signal contributions from blocks adjacent to each other. Also on either side of the blocks were these double tyrosines, and those act as distinctive landmarks because they cause the signal to drop dramatically. So in between these dramatic drops from the double tyrosines were what we call variable regions, and these variable regions are only different from each other because of these single amino acid mutations. One actual unintended benefit of this design was these really dramatic Y white dips make it easy to identify plateaus in the signal, which come from clip X dipping. So we're able to estimate that clip X stepping size is roughly two amino acids per step. Back to the variable regions, which was what we were really interested in, we were able to build a quote-unquote amino collar. So we built this by first taking the signals and then scaling them, downsampling them, filtering them. And afterwards, we'd extract out these variable regions and then take features from the variable regions and plug them into some machine learning model. And we could apply these machine learning models to any pastor and sequence the single amino acid mutations in the pastors. And the accuracies of these machine learning models were far outpaced um, RAM chance, but still left room for improvement. But what was really exciting was that when we found out a way to reread the proteins by causing the motor to lose its grip at the end of a read, we could get these rereads and these rereads would boost our accuracy quite significantly. And we were able to show that with these rereads, we would be able to sequence these proteins with decent accuracy if you're only considering just a finite set of amino acid changes. And one potential application we can see, even with these finite number of amino acid changes on these synthetic proteins, is being able to read millions or even billions of barcodes that are proteins with high accuracy by using nanopore analysis. So all the code for our amino collar and for doing these simulations is also on our GitHub that is linked to in the paper. The next thing we tested if we can detect phosphorylation made on protein strand. To do this, we made a protein that has phosphorylation sites. Firstly, we analyzed the protein without any incubation with 
kinase. When we incubate it with PKA, which is a protein kinase A, for one hour, we got current level increase here compared to the protein that hasn't incubated with the uh, protein kinase A. This section is corresponding to the sequence of the peptide called kemptide, which is a substrate of the PKA kinase. And then we also tested CK2, casein kinase 2. And then this kinase has different target sequence motif. So this kinase phosphorylates a linker section colored in light blue. As you can see, there is a lot of current increase, but we didn't see clear current increase at the section of the PKA's target section here. These results showing that we can actually see the difference of the sequence target motif of the two different kinases. For the results that I and Daphne explained, it's the results of the protein without any folded domain in the analyte section, but we prepare the new protein substrate with a folded domain, which is colored in red here. As a model, we use Titan I27 domain. We loaded the protein into the flow cell, and then this protein is going to be captured by the nanopore by electrophoresis. The folded domain is unfolded by the electrophoresis. And then that protein is going to be stored within the nanopore because we have a blocking domain that is stable enough to not get unfolded by electrophoresis. While this protein is stalling here, we added ClipX motor to the flow cell. And then the ClipX motor recognized the protein's SSRI tag. Then it starts to translocate the protein through the nanopore. Current trace shows the signals of the blue linker sections. And after that, we see several unfolding at attempts. And then after the unfolding is done, we see the translocation signals here. Eventually, we see the final signals correspond to the end terminus of the protein and then open pore states. So looking ahead of where we're going with this technology, right now, we think we have a platform that is ready uh, for sequencing of designed protein sequences, for example, uh, for applications in protein barcoding. What we think is the next step in the development of this technique is a approach to do single molecule proteoform fingerprinting. And we think the next stages for that is, is to collect more data so we can train better models that can map protein sequences into better nanopore squiggles. And then ultimately, as we're pushing towards de novo sequencing, we'll need, in addition to additional data of new protein sequences, we'll also need better nanopores such that we can get more sequence resolution specifically for protein molecules.